the RTE Rugby World Cup podcast, sponsored by Bank of Ireland. Hello and welcome along to the RTE Rugby World Cup podcast. No game for Ireland this weekend. A much needed break for Andy Farrell's side after their 13-8 win against South Africa last Saturday. Scotland next up for Ireland on Saturday the 7th of October. So with that in mind, we're going to do a little bit less on Ireland today than we normally would. A little bit later in the podcast, we're going to be joined by Christy Doran of The Roar. He's going to give us some insights into what it's been like following the Australian rugby circus in recent weeks. But before that, it's myself and Bernard Jackman, as usual on a Thursday, running through the big issues of the week. Burke, Birch, how are you doing? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Still um, still going back through that game and, and trying to find, or not trying to find, just seeing stuff that I hadn't seen. So just went back to the try last night and I actually wanted to look at the last play where uh, just James Lowe holds his feet really well and puts Mac Hansen away into none. To non rugby people are probably going, oh, like that looks so easy, but it's so hard to get it right. He pass off his left hand, just drawing the defender on him. It was an unbelievable pass from Gibson Park. And then just a little bit of animation from Pete as well. You know, he knows that ball's not going to him when it goes across his face, but putting his hands up and just maybe makes the defender hold for a second longer. But well, that wasn't actually what then caught my eye. It was, it was Sexton, the coolest man in, in the stadium, given what had happened for the previous 30 minutes when obviously we had turned down points of goal, we'd been on our own line, we had missed uh, line outs and you would expect an out half to be, I suppose, not panic because Johnny's not going to panic, but really animated, really desperate to get a touch. And it's just, it's like a captain's run for him. He's just walking behind the, the four pods, organizing it, getting Ireland into a, a zigzag pattern um, playing really the force playing really flat so South Africans can't get us behind the gain line and then eventually there's just one moment where uh, they get too many on the short side and he pulls the trigger and tries the, the sexton loop which in fairness they scramble uh, he gets very close and then that's from there then we, we score but um, you can hear him on the ref mic uh, even with the comms you can hear him just organising people and uh, again, again, it looks so simple, but I, I, I genuinely, I watch a lot of rugby like you do, Neil. You very rarely see a ten as composed in that situation, and everybody just doing what he says until it's the right moment. And um, yeah, it typifies, I think, how important he is to us. And that's not against uh, our other tens, but um, he is his game management and his understanding of how to uh, attack space um, and what you need to do to create that space is. Is second to none, really. Yeah, and it's it like for those who haven't seen the the breakdown of it, you posted it on X. The, yeah, it might be up for long because I, um, I, I, last night it's gone, is it? No, but I don't know how long. It, uh, yeah, uh, I've been deleting myself to be honest before before they get taken down by. Uh, so I don't know how long it'll be up. Yeah, but anyway, uh, like what I found really interesting was as you said, the there's a couple of points in it. One of them is when he's ordering every ordering everyone around, and initially they're coming down the blind side. And you can see the moment even in his head where he realizes, okay, open, now we're going. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm watching it, there's no particular reason in my head why he has seen something out there that all of a sudden, flick of a switch, no, we're going to the open side. But he has spotted something and it's just an instant order to everyone. Everyone's responding. They get outside. And then the other part as well is, as you say, they, they tried for his kind of trademark loop but just the presence of mind where he knows this loop isn't going to come off and he has to hold on to it for that half second yeah. and cuts back inside towards the posts. And even a small act like that brings everyone back in towards the post and it creates even more space outside for, for James Lowe and Matt Hansen. And then, as you said, what a lot of people might consider just a simple catch and pass from James Lowe. But I can tell you the amount of times I've sat on press conferences over the last couple of years when a coach is talking about the importance of just the amount of amount, amount of work they're doing on the catch pass because it's very easy on paper but if you have a ball coming out at you and you know you know you just have a split second to get that pass out wide when a player like I can't remember who it was will say Damien Delende for argument's sake one of the best defenders in the game is is charging up at you from five meters out. It's a very hard thing to do to to know you just have that half a second to get that pass away. Yeah, and that's why the South Africans are so hard to break down because they don't give you any time and you have to nail it. And if if James Lowe 
carries that one one step, he gets tackled man and ball, they potentially counter hook and the opportunity is lost. So that's why they defend like that. People would say, oh, they should have been wider. They generally get away with not being as as, as wide as other teams in defence because they commit to come up and in. And they're actually in the in the Sexton one, there was actually an opportunity to score on the left hand side. You see Johnny running out the back of Pete. Um, and it would have been a, it would have been a two v one, which I think he would have executed. Pete doesn't give it, but again, like Johnny, I would say the old Johnny might have shown some emotion there or shown frustration. Uh, um, he just went back into okay, well let's go again, let's build again now, let's let's find another opportunity, you know. And obviously it takes a lot of good breakdown work and a lot of strong carries from everybody. It's not it's not just Johnny, but. It was um it was just something that stood out to me, you know. Um and that calmness is gonna be absolutely massive um as we go forward, you know, that it builds and everyone listened to him and believing in him. So um touch wood he, he stays um he stays safe. Yeah, I'm in I'm in tours at the moment and we're gonna get a, a squad update a little bit later on. It'll be after uh, I think around three three o'clock, half past three Irish time by the time that update is out. So this podcast will be up and out by then. But um on South Africa, one of the, I suppose, prevailing, it's funny the way the the kind of opinions have kind of just threaded themselves out over the first few days where initially it was they left the points out on the tee. Then people were asking, why didn't they go for the corner off those two fast to Clark penalties anyway, rather than kicking them? The one I've seen in the last couple of days, and I think it's probably just because the days are going on and there's new opinions that have to get out, but it uh, the idea that South Africa didn't go for the corner because they were trying to hold back the, try not to give away any any of their plans for their mall or any variations that they might have off it. Are, are you buying that argument? No, I, I but I, mean, I don't think they're trying to hide mall. I, I think they obviously made a decision not to try and maul that much against Ireland. I think they, people will talk about the kicks and obviously they were absolutely um, a key factor in them not winning, but or, um. I thought South Africa overplayed in general. Uh, and, I mean, their mindset from the very first kickoff where Faf tries that, you know, crazy pass in his own 22 that we end up obviously getting a line out from. I mean, that's not South Africa. Uh, and that will never happen again. And I, I don't, well, obviously maybe, who did they play? They play uh, Tonga, is it? Um, they still play Tonga, yeah. They, they may be ambitious against Tonga. But I think now as they get into the quarterfinal um, and onwards, they if, if they stay involved, they will be much more pragmatic. And the mall will be part of that. And I look back at that New Zealand South Africa match, um, the last warm-up game, and the mall was an important part of them, I suppose, uh taking the legs out of New Zealand or or showing their strength. Um and I think that look at in hindsight, even if they didn't uh, some people said, Oh, Ireland defended their mall well in November. Yeah, we, we, we did for sure. I'm not saying that they would have taken us part of the mall time. But when you have a seven-one split, it's certainly a, a way of using your forward power and your and, and your superior numbers on the bench to actually take on the pack. You know, it, like the reason it was such a good game as such was both teams wanted to play, um, and I think obviously South Africa have made really good gains in their attack, and it's certainly a decent attack. But it's not their super strength. It's not who they are our attack is who we are really and the surprising thing and the most admirable thing uh, admirable thing for me was that we we had to defend had, defense had to be our thing uh, last Saturday and, and it was good enough to help us win which is which is which is amazing um, and I think we'll be disappointed that our attack well I think the South African defense is better than certainly I gave a credit for. I knew it was very good but I thought it went to a new level last week I mean what Ireland threw at it um, 31 dominant tackles they made like they were they're very very hard to break down um, and that's why I fear them more now after that game like it's amazing if we had lost that match people would be saying Ireland are soft or they're mentally weak and so the bubble has burst etc um, and it'd be very hard to make an argument against that even though based on what we saw you know we were we were right there and then likewise in actual fact it's the opposite with South Africa I think South Africa lost the game but I knew, they nearly went up more in my estimation, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I think they, they can fix things quickly. And as I said, by actually not being as uh, as uh, ambitious, they'll be harder to beat. And um, and obviously, they bring a goal kicker in. Um, they bring a sub-hooker in who's a hooker. And they're, they're already better. Yeah, and it, it's funny you actually say that because that was pretty much along the lines of the, 
the last thing I was going to ask around this game. I was listening to uh, a podcast from New Zealand yesterday and I found it interesting because we can kind of end up in a little bubble of opinions when we're listening to all our own stuff in Ireland. But their main takeaway was that South Africa left it behind more so than Ireland won it. And their main their main takeaway was they were a lot more relieved that they're probably not going to be playing South Africa in a quarter final than they are Ireland potentially. Yeah. Look at uh, of course I think the, look at the, their recent memory of South Africa is that game in Twickenham. Um and I think what New Zealanders saw against France was potentially a weakness in their front five to match up against a, a team like France who are quite similar in their in their makeup to South Africa. So I can understand why they would prefer to avoid them. I, like even though even though Ireland have beaten them recently, um uh, there's certain teams you don't really want to play. And I think South Africa or France are uh, are are made up that way, particularly if you're New Zealand. So I understand that. I don't think that's a slight on us. Um oh, no, yeah, obviously we can even I didn't no, even kind of mean it like no, that. No, 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 no. Be, yeah, but I think we can be better. Be very we very impressed with South Africa. No, no, absolutely. Uh, um and but we can be better. We we, we can be better for sure. Obviously our line out. Um, didn't help, but I still think South Africa's defense is incredibly difficult. And I, my fear is, my fear is for us if we play them in a final, right? And I'm a jumping head by a month here, or whatever. But my fear is, it's harder to play. It's harder to throw that James Lowe pass, even though technically it's not. But it is. You know what I mean? It's harder in a final. Um, do you remember the one where Faf nearly intercepted Johnny? Uh, yeah. It ended up being a penalty. But like, that's not a minute. He's not a million miles away from regathering that. You know, um, and that's. And that's that. That's my fear. And if you look at how they beat England, obviously the scrum was a big part of it. But um, effectively, they just pressurized and pressurized and pressurized them, and eventually it broke up late when Kobe got that try. Um, so yeah, they they're certainly big contenders. Um, yeah, it, for me, it, it hasn't changed. It's 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 France, New Zealand, Ireland, and but I wouldn't write off New Zealand. Yes, um, New Zealand obviously are very dangerous uh, in any given day. Mm-hmm. Um, Scotland Scotland against Romania is the late game in Pool B on Saturday night 8 o'clock kickoff Irish time in Lille um, we probably won't learn too much about them this weekend let's be honest but what do you think we did learn about them or did we learn much about them against Tonga at the weekend yeah look they were impressive I mean they have some phenomenal attacking players and, and they have uh, the ability to hurt teams quite easily um, so they, they took Tonga apart pretty well um, and it was a nice positive reaction from obviously that disappointing South African defeat for them uh, but I don't I don't know if they've proven anything that, like you know um, I think we'll be so happy with how we defended against uh, South Africa particularly our breakdown threat across the field which um, whether that was counter hook and whether that's choke tackles or whether that's um, jackal threats we took that to a new level um, and that's how you beat Scotland you know you you and they are quite loose. They're quite loose in their attack because they want to play with such weight. And um, uh, look, they're not, it's, not, it's not a gimme by any manner of means. But I don't think we saw anything against Tonga that that changed our mind about about Scotland. Um, you still have to put the squeeze on them, and um, we we've shown the ability to do that over the last four or five years. And I think the South Africa game, we showed that we ha- we'll have the ability to do it again. So uh, the only the only thing is complacency, but I don't see how I don't see that that affecting this team really uh, at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a proper test. It's not it's not a walkover by any manner of means. It's going to be a proper test match. But realistically, I think we we would have to say we, we should have enough to to win. Um, we've spoken a lot in the last few days and probably last few months as well about Ireland's own issues at the line out, but defensively there's never really been much of a question about how good Ireland and disruptive Ireland can be at the line out and is that still a go to area if we're attacking Scotland taking on that yeah. because we saw it in Murrayfield back in March and we've seen it in in other games down I I certainly remember Murrayfield 2 years ago as well when Ireland absolutely dismantled their line out is that still an area of concern from a Scottish point of view yeah look at the blew up massively against South Africa I think what they have a tendency to do is Different than us. So we lost whatever four, four of the, of the first five or uh, four in a row to start. Four in a row, yeah. We lost four in a row, and then, and then we settled. Whereas I think what I've seen of Scotland over the last two or three years is, um, they don't have to lose the first four, but if they lose two two in a row, 
it seems to go to pot and it did against South Africa. So a big part of the reason South Africa were so dominant in that first game uh, against Scotland was the Scotland line out just fell apart. There was no lifts, there was overthrows, there was not straight. So um, that is the that is a worry for them. And I don't think, uh, I think that'll be in the back of their mind. And as you said, it is a strong, uh, an area of strength for us. So I, I actually think the way we kind of regrouped a bit, look, it wasn't idea. We had to, we had to go to five man. We had to took the ball to the front, but, the ball was was more important um, than the where we won it, and um, I'm not sure Scotland have shown that kind of ability to adapt. You know, they seem to even against South Africa, they kept trying to throw or to the back and over the top, uh, even and in fairness, it is free there. But when you've lost confidence, um, it wasn't really the right thing to do. So and maybe they've learned from that. But I think we can get after them at at defensive line at time uh, for sure. Right, well, we'll talk a bit more about Scotland next week. We still have a couple more podcasts to go before uh, that game in Paris on the 7th of October. I do obviously want to talk about Wales, you see, because we're we're going to be speaking to Christy Doran around Australia in a few minutes. Mm. We've already already recorded that chat. Um, and I think it would be unfair to put so much conversation into what went wrong for Australia without really acknowledging what went right for Wales because a 46 win against Australia uh, last Saturday, a win against Georgia and their top of the pool guaranteed going into a quarterfinals and I don't think that's anything we were expecting six months ago coming in off the Six Nations, Birch. No, and in fairness to Gatland, um, I actually, getting them qualified you know, they may go on to win a semi or to get to a semi-final which would be phenomenal two back-to-back semi-finals obviously having um, got there in South Africa in, in, against South Africa in, in Japan, and actually, in fact, they should have beaten South Africa uh, <laughs> the World Cup semi final four yeah. years ago. But to get them back to a semi final would be would be phenomenal. When you think about, like, you would sometimes think someone like Gatlin coming back in, he needs to get a bounce quickly. Um, that's traditionally how it works in football. It definitely works like that. So, you know, they sack a manager, a, fo- a manager comes in, and he gets a couple of results quite in his first month, and that gets him up and away. Or maybe keeps them up in, in the premiership. But with Gatlin, he didn't get that bounce. In actual fact, he got more turmoil and chaos and the threat and strike and all the trouble with the regions and all the trouble with the, the governance and Welsh rugby. And he was in the middle of it. And it was a very poor Six Nations campaign. But in fairness to him, he he always maintained that when he got him for the summer, that's that's when he comes into his own. I mean, this this World Cup cycle, this um, this preparation and well, and the Welsh players, there's still enough of them left, and the youngsters who never worked under Gatland have grown up seeing Wales do well at World Cup. So he he copy and pasted what he did, you know, what he's done before, you know, big long training camps, um, sleeping at altitude, training at at ground level in in uh, was it Austria, um, then Turkey for another camp, a lot of time in the Vale, and. They got to win the first stop against England in um in Twickenham. Now after, or sorry, in in, in the Principality, the first round of the uh, uh pre or autumn internationals, and then he said, "That's it, that's it. We're done. We're done. We're, we're very fit. We're much fitter than England, and it doesn't really matter what happens now because I'm going to change the team up. I know you lads have got that win. And um, now you could have argued all through August that that win against England was the form guide was was irrelevant, but he basically convinced the players that they're back to the level that they were. So Garrett Davies, for example, at the weekend, that's the best he's played since the last World Cup, to be fair. You know, um, Wayne Rice was a player that wasn't really used under um, uh, okay. under Pivac. It was, was outstanding. They found, Jack Morgan, Pivac said he's too small to play international rugby. He's absolutely class. So it's not just fitness. It's actually some selection issues as well um, that, he's, that he's got right. And he's lost Ken Owens. He's lost Alwyn Jones. He lost Tiprick. Um, but the, the old stagers that are still there, um, the Dan Biggers, the, the George Norts, uh, the Adam Beards, even Adam Beards isn't that old, but he's part of that old regime. Um, they have really stood up. And I thought, you know, when Bigger went off after 10 minutes, I thought, wow, because he was so important for them against Fiji. But Anscombe came in and, and look, they've got a they've got a pretty basic game plan, game model, but everyone knows what they're doing. And when you come up against a team like Australia, who aren't anywhere near as sure, that can be the, the telling factor. And now they've got confidence. And um, yeah, it's a it's an amazing tournament. And like so Wales needed this. Wales needed a quarterfinal. I mean, the the level of of this discontent in the in the game, I, I, like 
in the community game in Wales is, is in an awful state. There's games cancelled every weekend because they can't field teams, etc. So the national team doing well at a World Cup is a big part of trying to get that love affair back in, in Welsh rugby. Yeah, and I, to go back on one thing you said there, like they're they're not world beaters by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. but they know what they are. And I think importantly as well, they, they know what they aren't. So they know what their limitations are and they know what they can play to. And it's in such a contrast to Australia who 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 don't look like they know what they are. And and similarly, you know, to, to go back on another point on Jack Morgan, like you mentioned, there are someone like him who's come in vice captain now, he's 10, 11 caps and looks like a, a 50 cap veteran. And you look at the players they lost over the summer, Alan Wynne jones Ken Owens, Justin Tipperick, guys with vast amount of experience, not to mention vast amount of trophies and Six Nations Grand Slam titles. But the the way some of those other players, the guys who might have been in the, the middle tier of leadership 12 months ago have stepped up in comparison to, to those who didn't maybe in an Australian shirt where at times out there, it just looked like they were flapping around fairly rudderless. The, yeah. the the contrast between the two sides out in the pitch and Leon was remarkable in that respect. Yeah, and I think we ha- you're 100% right, Neil, to to praise that because it won't have been easy. I mean, all these lads have had significant pay cuts um, and more cuts to come in, in the future. So the financial side of it in Wales is actually more bleak than the financial side of it in Australia. Um and you know they have they haven't let that actually affect them. They've they've got themselves back into into shape. And actually, I don't remember, but there's a, there's a snippet from Gatland addressing his team in in the Vale, and and it talks about look at you know we we've always been a team that's been hard to beat, you know, and and been been resilient and digging in, and that's what we're going to be, you know. So it's pretty simple stuff. But again, you always would like to see a team. Um, you know, you should be able to see what a team stands for without hearing it from the coach or, or reading on a banner. And I think if you watch this Wales team over the last couple of weeks, they're certainly playing to that that type of of mantra, and it suits their mentality well. And they they're buying into it, and they they have enough good athletes, and they're fit enough, and they're well organized enough to to do it. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, it's uh, look, it's been helped by the fact that um, Australia blown up, but. Give Wales credit. That was a pressure game for them as well. And they um they implemented that game plan to a T. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, really interesting to see it. Um one final bit actually before we bring in Christy. Like from your own point of view as a coach, it must be fascinating to see how the likes of Wales, Australia, and England have all gone down various different routes over the course of the last nine, ten months, having changed coaches so close to a World Cup to to see the the massive contrast between Australia and Wales and England maybe maybe somewhere in the middle, just to see the the different routes that a team can take. Yeah, I, I think the most surprising thing for me is that Eddie has got it so wrong because I actually think there's a lot of talent in that in that group, um, and he's obviously the one with himself and Gatlin. Eddie has more uh, work experience than Gatlin, so he's the most experienced of those three. Uh, Bortig obviously the least amount of experience, but Bortig has always known what he believes are the key KPIs of, of winning a rugby match. I mean, that's been clear with Leicester and with England. It was just, they, England never looked getting like anywhere near getting it right. Whereas Eddie knows the World Cups um, are generally won with teams who are, are very clear about how they want to play. And that was the most surprising thing for me watching Australia against Wales was how little structure or, um, or how much, how big a, lack of a plan there was which Eddie knows the game incredibly well whether he's he's got caught up in other stuff or he hasn't been able to to coach it well enough or he doesn't think it's relevant anymore I don't know but that was that, that's the big thing I mean it has worked for England now and it's worked for Wales making that late change um, and yeah and, and obviously for Australia unless there's a miracle um, it's it's been a massive disaster but and such a bad it's played out so badly that it could affect what their plan was for post this World Cup. You know, the 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 reason they brought Eddie Jones in wasn't just for this World Cup; it was for the next four years. And now it looks unlikely, or uh, there's a strong chance that that's not going to happen either. Which is, is it's a double disaster. Let's hear from Australia, Christy Doran, coming up next on the RT Rugby World Cup podcast.
We are joined now by Christy Doran, rugby editor for The Roar in Australia. Christy, um, when you hopped on the plane to go from Australia to France a few weeks ago, I, I get the feeling people in Australia, there wasn't a huge level of optimism for what was going to come in the World Cup based on the way the last couple of years and particularly the rugby championship had gone. But um, I don't expect you thought this was going to be coming down the line. Australia pretty much we're expecting anyway going out in a in a pool stage i'll tell you what there was we w- went to a pub a couple of days before and i was the first aussie over here I arrived on the 23rd and and australia played france on the 27th in paris but a couple of days before i left there was a couple of journos we were sharing a few beers and there was a few of us that decided to get on us not getting out of the pool and uh fortunately that's the only only uh, good thing, consolation prize off the back of a horrendous World Cup campaign. And everything is up in the air now, from the coach to the board uh, to the fallout to the states, what's going on. And, and it's been a, a catastrophic uh, campaign, this. And there's there's one more game to go on Sunday against Portugal. But this is an almighty blow for a, a, a game that's already struggling back in Australia. And Bert, just before you logged on, myself and Christy were chatting away and I was talking about uh, talking about him with the the likeness and similarities this reminding me of of Ireland in 2007 here in France as well. Yeah, just meltdown. But it, it seems to be, I think we went into the World Cup probably optimistic in 2007, but there was obviously fears about about Australia's form. I, I, I thought I thought back in November, I, I spent um, some time with, with Dave Rennie and, and and his coaching staff the day they played Ireland. And I thought Australia were actually dark horses for something to do something special in the World Cup then because that November tour was was reasonably positive, Christy. I remember meeting you over at it. I mean, you could have easily beaten Ireland, um, came back against Wales and, and could have beaten France. I know you lost Italy in the in the game in between, but wow, like the the you weren't a million miles away, I didn't feel. And then obviously what we saw against Wales um, and all the the background noise and the the tension that Eddie seems to have created. I mean, what's it been like amongst the, and we're getting snippets of it, but what's it been like since that Wales game in terms of media relations with the players, the squad, Eddie, and then obviously what's going to happen in, in rugby Australia? Well, they put up a few of their more thoughtful players yesterday at, at, at the interview opportunity uh, on Wednesday. And, and, you know, Andrew Calloway's and the Dan Palmer's and and the, Dan Palmer actually probably surprised quite a few people by saying that the uh, that the coaching staff had done an excellent job. Uh, Andrew Calloway, on the other hand, was was obviously very disappointed. I spoke to him in the immediate aftermath of the game in the mix zone, and he was shattered, as all of the Australians were. And there was tears out in the field. And you're right by pointing to the October November for us our our spring tour. Uh, your and 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 we weren't miles away, no, but we weren't miles away for three years. And there was a there was a there was a feeling of if we're always falling short under Dave Rennie, why is that? And and there it seemed like the the mood wasn't driving a high performance, a winning culture, and that naturally has been the hallmark of Eddie Jones's kind of coaching career, but. Clearly, that it's it's gone to absolute shit over the last nine months. It probably started when Dan McKellar got and accepted the job at Leicester back in back in February, and 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 with his departure, you saw uh, probably a stabilising influence, a person that drives standards, uh, perhaps probably the heir apparent, the next kind of coach in line, a guy that's a master of his craft around scrum play. Um, the rolling more he'd been tapped into his services with Steve Borthwick back ahead of the 2019 campaign. And since then, it's just every decision that Eddie Jones has made from coaching uh, appointments to selection on the field to tactics, they've all backfired in epic proportions. And like coming into the, the selection has obviously been a massive issue then as well. And if you look at the, the squad that went to the World Cup and the, and the side that was picked over the last couple of weeks. I know you've injuries to Will Skelton and Tani Tupa to to include there and put a bit of an asterisk beside, but the the continuity between Rugby Championship and World Cup or the lack of continuity between Rugby Championship and World Cup is it's a little bit alarming as to what the, the entire strategy of this summer was being. 
Yeah, and I think there was a, a change of vision, a change of approach, because in Pretoria, we were hammered 43-12. Australia was hammered 43-12, and, and the tactics didn't seem great, but also you saw guys like Michael Hooper, who typically have always won that contact battle, get absolutely steamrolled by uh, Etzebeth and the rest. And you saw Quade Cooper falling off tackles. You saw him failing to kind of implement the game plan that they wanted. And I just thought that Eddie Jones decided from that point in time, we're going to we're gonna cut this cord. Uh, the players that I thought might be good enough aren't good enough. We need to start again. And he's fared well then brutally uh, and ushered through uh, this young generation. But they... They took in a 24-year-old Ben Donaldson who got shifted from the Waratahs to the force this year because he wasn't good enough and hadn't played well and the, and the Waratahs didn't think he was his, their future. Carter Gordon, 22-year-old, played basically his first full season after a couple of years of false starts. And history shows that you don't win without experienced playmakers. Now, whether or not Eddie Jones feels like this side, though, can do something in two years' time against the Lions and four years with a home World Cup. That is what Eddie Jones has spoken about, the need to get experience into these players so that Australia has an opportunity with these big feature events in the years to come. But, wow, like it's it's really like the psychological damage. You're not quite sure. The the right of ramifications regarding broadcast money at the moment, Rugby Australia is only getting $29 million a year. That's a, that's a drop from $45 million previously per season. And you compare that to about $2.2 billion for the AFL and a similar sort of sum to the NRL over five to seven year periods. You get a picture around where Rugby Australia is headed, where Australian rugby is headed. And it's a really steep decline, which brings into focus every area of the game. And that, Birch, that's a real tricky one for them because not only have they got the, the long-term issues to sort out about where they sit commercially and in terms of a very, very competitive Australian sports market, but they also have to have a big think about the short term as well because there's a Lions tour coming up in a couple of years. There's a Rugby World Cup that they're hosting as well. Um, as as sensible as it might be to, to put all your eggs into 10, 15 years down the line, they can't really afford to to lose track of what's coming in the next 24, 48 months. Yeah, look, I think I think I, I read um that they struggled to refinance the their debt. Um private equity didn't didn't want to look at it. I, I, my understanding is World Rugby are are obviously very keen to keep Australia um at the very top and may may help. And obviously you will have income coming in over the next four years, which you can't bank on after that. You know, you're not going to get a, a Lions tour. Lions tour is only, it's not going to be every four years. It's going to be every 12 years. And obviously, we don't know when the next home world cup will be. So, I think the, there obviously needs to be a, a long-term plan for Australian rugby. But the, the medium term is pretty important as well. And, you know, um, obviously, you need to be, you need to win this weekend, not to have to qualify. You look at Australia, you will qualify for next world cup um, at home. But it's really to be dining at the top table. And, and I'd love to... Christy, I've been reading some stuff around um, whether you you drop one of your franchises, whether you make uh, you know a smaller elite player pool. I mean, how would you see what is the key driver? Do you think in terms of making sure Australia are competitive in two years' time? Forget about forget about ten years' time. I mean, two years' time. How can Australia be you know really competitive or maybe win a Lions tour? It's it's a great question. How you how do you flip the script immediately? Uh, I think just 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 quickly on the Super Rugby issue, I, I spoke and, and and the idea of dropping back to four that was explored in 2018 with the Western Force being cold, and then a couple of years later they come back and COVID plays a part. Mm. That th- th- there's some valid arguments there, and even Steve Hansen just spoke about that the other day. But you speak to guys like Steve Anderson who's helped set up the high performance program in Ireland and Scotland. You speak to Mick Byrne who helps uh, play the part with the centralisation component in New Zealand after their own disappointments with the World Cups it was brought to a head in 07 when they bowed out uh, very quickly at the quarterfinals. They they don't think that cutting a, a side is the issue. It's about building the base. But we all know that building the base doesn't happen over two years. It happens over 10 years. So into the short term, how do you get a side ready for a line series? Well, you know, Eddie Jones's future is completely up in the air. And whether or not he goes to Japan or gets sacked, who knows? But he's an expensive commodity at the moment. So they, RA can't afford to pay him out. That's the first thing that needs to be said there. If he was to go, 
who's the next candidate? There's only for my one one person that that should be really considered, and that's Dan McKellar. Uh, and and he's currently at Leicester. I, I would presume he'd be able to manage to wriggle his way out to come back. He's the sort of guy that knows the Australian landscape very very well. He doesn't have the international head coaching experience that some might, but he has enough. And I'd build people around him like Laurie Fisher, who's still got a lot to offer the game in Australia. Um, there's enough talent still within this side, um, within this squad. They've spurned a lot of it. They left out a few others. And the guys that you made mention of Will Skelton's, the Taniela Tupos, they're injured. But even Alan Alatoa, he didn't even get to to uh, the World Cup because he he did in his Achilles. And the biggest thing that probably needs to have a real microscope look at, forensic look at, is the strength and conditioning. Because how does someone like an Alan Alatoa go down? He was complaining of calf soreness in the days leading up to him being put out there at the MCG and, and ends up doing his Achilles 35 minutes into the first half against the AB. So there needs to be some serious scrutiny around uh, the strength and conditioning programs, making sure and ensuring that the, there's some more stability at the five super rugby franchises. Um, there's been a, 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 you know, the Queensland Reds have struggled, have, uh, I wouldn't say cliffed, dived, but they've, 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 they plateaued a couple of years ago and have gone down since. They've got a, Les Kiss has entered the frame there, some experience with him. They need to be building and strengthening these super rugby sides rather than necessarily, I think, spending uh, millions of millions on NRL players who, and, and the latest is Angus Crichton, who they're looking at bringing back, but he's a 27, 28-year-old guy who hasn't played rugby in 10 years and might have been a good super rugby, uh, a schoolboy player, but they're short-term fixes, I would think. The the match itself at the weekend, almost overshadowed by the the Eddie Jones story about that was broken by Tom Deason in the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald that Eddie had held discussions with Japan just a couple of days before that final warm-up against France. Um, That has obviously soured the mood even further after the defeat. I, so you were writing a couple of days ago in the roar that you would still keep Eddie Jones on as head coach for the next few years at least. And what has the reaction been like to, to that? Are you in the minority or the majority in no, that opinion? Uh, it's interesting. There's been, I wouldn't say it's divided at 50-50, but I think people can appreciate that after five different head coaches in 10 years, that maybe it's not the head coach. So that, that is the issue. When, you, when you're saying guys like Dave Rennie, um, Ewan McKenzie, Robbie Deans, that they are the issues, but they win everywhere else, particularly someone like a Robbie with the Crusaders and then Panasonic. Uh, Ewan McKenzie did a great job with the Waratahs, the, the Reds, had success at national level too as an assistant. If these guys are always seemingly the issue, well, why do they win elsewhere? So I think that Eddie Jones has got still a hell of a lot to offer Clearly, he tried to break every rule because he didn't think that they were going to be able to win with the current mob um, of both uh, assistants and players. But wow, hasn't it failed in effort proportions? Uh, and and he's, I, I feel like he's almost painting himself as a bit of a martyr here. He he's been saying that they needed to, he needed to, and someone needed to usher through this generation because the previous generations had struggled. And we have to make this point clear. Since 2016, and Australia was very lucky to make the final, they should have bowed out in the quarterfinal in 2015 if it wasn't for Craig Schubert penalty that allowed Bernard Foley to slot a penalty. But he, Australia had won 41% of games between 2016 and Eddie Jones taking over. That number's dropped to 39.5% now. That's a terrible number. Like, that's tier two status, isn't it? Like, you compare that to Ireland to, and France, you can barely drop a game at the moment. It kind of paints the picture that not all was rosy before Eddie Jones took over. Christy, I, I agree that the results have been declining for, for the guts of 10 years. But in fairness, I, I think the the margin of of defeat has, has also grown significantly in the last... Six or seven months. I mean, the last warm up game against France, even though there was positives, the scrum was good. It was quite a heavy defeat, losing to Fiji. And then that Wales performance. I mean, when you have to, it's a must win game. It's probably the biggest blowout by, uh, you know, a competitive nation I, I, I've seen in the poorest performance. So, uh, I mean, do you think Eddie can, will survive this? Is, is it easier for him now to go to Japan and where obviously the scrutiny, scrutiny is less? Um, and, 
it is more of a development job. Whereas the reality is, despite I heard Eddie Jones saying it takes six years to build a team. Um, well, that means they're not going to be competitive for the Lions Tour or the next World Cup. You know what I mean? And whereas in Japan, he probably has he probably has four years to rebuild to rebuild this Japanese team again because it's it's kind of probably end in the end of its cycle. I mean, do you can will or will Rugby Australia stand by Eddie? I know they can't sack him, or will he just feel that the relationship is too toxic and it's hurting the team? It's more likely that he walks away than he's sacked, I think. And and that's there's every possibility that occurs. I, I think, you know, look at Clive Woodward's side of when he took over and, yeah, they struggled in the first couple of years. By 01, they were humming. And then by by 2003, they win the World Cup. And I think there's there's other other examples of, of a side that can build in, in three to five years, um, mm. not necessarily in six years. I think he was, uh, he, was, he was a bit over the top there with that one. But I, look, there would be a lot of people that would be happy if he was to walk away. And that's a saddening kind of thing, given that he's a guy that's been around the international game for so long and he's very well respected. We've got to remember his winning percentage with England was 73%. You know, what Australia could do. I, I agree with the score line. It did blow out and it was an embarrassment, wasn't it? There wasn't a single element of the game against Wales that they that they looked competent in. And that's a failure of skill set, a failure of being able to adapt and deal with pressure. And the players, to their uh, fairness, have put up their hands and said, look, what we delivered wasn't good enough. But, um, you know, super rugby matches... Uh, Australia has struggled at super rugby level for a long time. It's it, the last time they reached a final was back in, in 2014. And since then the score lines have blown out, particularly against New Zealand, but defense has been the Achilles heel for a long time. Now, why is that the case? And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to see the correlation between super rugby sides and the vast majority struggling. And then also seeing that at an international level, like you can't just become a, a good player overnight. Um, takes years Players in Australia are often rushed into super rugby teams because the depth has not been here for some time. And I think it's just being exposed right now. And you, you speak to some people that have known about the game, the issues, and they've all been saying rock bottoms you know, before the World Cup. They were saying rock bottoms still ahead. So it, you know, It's not a thing that was one or two years ago. It's still to come. And that's the concern when you think that there's some big, big events coming. And even if we do... Even if Australia or RA go down a debt avenue, which is what they're going to do, uh, wow! Well, like, where, where's the money go then? Because you're just going to be paying off your debt. So it's a slippery slope and ugly state of affairs in Australia and rugby. And they've got to beat Portugal this weekend, which you would think will happen. But wow, from the events that we've seen over the last month, you can't take that for granted. I know your I know your push for time won't keep you much longer. I do want to ask you though. I, where does David New Sephora fit in with Australia? I know you interviewed him when you were over uh, in November when we were chatting to you as well. You got to sit down with him and you spoke to Andy Friend, for example, a couple of weeks ago and he was talking up what David New Sephora could do in an Australia system. His time is going to be coming up in Ireland in the next couple of years. Is he someone you think Australia should be going after? Oh, look, they, they've already gone after him and and... I can imagine David returning to Australia. He, he's got a place on the on the east coast of in the eastern seaboard of Australia. But why? I, I think the great question for him would be why would he want to do it? He's already tried a couple of times, and both times he's tried to implement change, particularly with uh, the then Australian Rugby Union around the time of 2012, 2013, before he, he went to Ireland. He was pushed out. The states weren't prepared to offer up some power. Uh, they weren't prepared to go down a centralised route. The current administration are desperately hoping that they do. But I can't imagine like a new supporter would jump back on board unless some of the things, the politics in Australian rugby, the federated model, unless it comes to a head, Australia is going to continue to eat itself alive. New supporter would be superb. I, I, I get the feeling that, yeah, they are looking for a new high performance manager. They're looking at announcing and and being able to review one by the end of the year. But I wouldn't think you support will be one of those candidates. Just finally then, before we let you go, you mentioned Australia to beat Portugal this weekend. I think and probably on, on, on the Irish shores, we're probably a bit more optimistic they will do that than, than you might be. There's the possibility, for example, if Australia and Fiji results go a particular way, that Australia 
are still technically within a shot of getting to a quarter final. But realistically, you're relying on Portugal to beat Fiji next week, which I don't think anyone will. What do you think would be more humiliating for Australia having to having their chances of reaching a quarterfinal officially be done this week or having to stay in France next week and train on the the one percent or the the less than one percent chance that they could get to a quarter final? Well, yeah, and of course they don't play uh, the following mm. week either, so they will be just sitting there hoping. Oh, I've been told that the Wallabies are getting flogged this week once again. Eddie Jones isn't just allowing them to coast through, and 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 it, it paints a picture of uh, the necessity to win this weekend, but also uh, his high demanding standards. Now, whether or not he should be doing that, whether or not he should be taking his foot off the gas, given the events of the last two weeks. Uh, you you could argue that too. Uh, what would be more humiliating? I think anything that can get Australia to a quarterfinal is imperative. So you can't understate how much the game is on tender hooks back in Australia at the moment. I, I, you guys have travelled, you've seen it, you've seen the slippery slope since '99 when they were last World Cup winners. They need a result, and and the broadcasters need a result. Um, the the public need to discover some heroes because at the moment they could probably barely, with the exception of the hardcore Australian rugby fans, the average Joe would not be able to tell you who a Wallaby is at the moment. And that's a damning kind of uh, damning state of affairs in Australia at the moment that you wouldn't be able to walk down George Street and know who, who these Wallabies are. Birch, anything finally you want to ask Christy quickly before we wrap up? No, just good luck. It's not easy. It's not easy uh, living in in, a, in a, an atmosphere as negative as this. So hopefully it turns for you. Yeah, well, hopefully they show a little bit more creativity than just giving it to Sami Karevi to try to barge through the front door uh, first phase off the scrum or if they can get a line out working inside the 22, that'd be nice. Well, fingers crossed they can wrap it up with a, a good performance this week and safe trip back home as well. Christy, as always, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, good gentlemen. Cheers. The RTE Rugby World Cup Podcast, sponsored by Bank of Ireland.